Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray to prepare ourselves for the Bible study tonight. You'll open your mouth and talk to the Lord and tell the Lord to prepare you. Prepare your heart. Prepare you in the inner man, your spirit, that the word of God coming to us tonight, coming from the very throne of God, through his chosen human vessel, that that word will reach you at the point of your spiritual need. Open your mouth and pray. Pray that God will give you understanding of his word, and that the word be applied by the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God to your heart, and will do its effective, effectual work in your heart, that God will give you the heart like that of Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet with total concentration and focus, that God will help you. That your heart will not be wandering here and there. But as you sit in the very presence of the Lord. That he reveal his mind through his word unto you. Making you to hear. Making you to know. Things you've never heard. And things you've never known. That this period of study will not be a wasted period for you. But it will be a time, a period, where you go deeper in the things of the Spirit, and you are more enriched in spiritual things. That the power in the Word, the Word of Truth, that regenerates, that saves, that transforms, that Transforming power, regenerating power of the world will work so effectively in your heart that the enemy of your soul will not steal from you the word that will profit you spiritually. Jesus prayed and said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Pray that the cleansing, sanctifying power in the word of God will reach out to you in the very center of your heart and life. Cleansing you, purging you, purifying you, sanctifying you. Making you to live the life. Sanctified life, purified life, holy life, righteous life. That will bring glory to God and to God alone. Pray that this word will help you to overcome every temptation to stand firm on compromising in times of persecution and trial. That what we are learning from the word tonight will give you great, great assistance, support, help, so that the life of the believer, the overcoming life, The victorious life, the victorious and triumphant life, that this word provides that for you, that you'll not be a nominal church member just coming to fulfill a regular weekly duty, but that you'll follow the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and the word that reaches out to you. Inscribed and reaching on the table of your heart will do the work that the Almighty God has sent it to do in your heart lie. Pray that the word acting like fire will take your lukewarmness and coldness away, will bring a revival in your soul, a desire, a passion to want to follow the Lord. And follow him step after step, living, thinking, walking, doing everything like the word demands in your life. Prepare yourself 
to receive from the Lord himself. Make a covenant with the Lord. Lord, everything I hear, everything I receive, everything you teach, everything I learn, I will by your grace think about all these things, meditate on them, apply them to my life so that it will make me live a life that glorifies and honors you. And pray that as a word, that's a great regenerating, changing, transforming, sanctifying work in your heart and life. That God will give you the love, the passion, the interest to talk to other people, to teach other people, to admonish other people, to encourage other people to that those who don't know the Lord, that through you, through your admonition, your exhortation, your witnessing, your evangelism, they will come to know the Lord as their personal Savior. And that God will help you to live a life that's a model for them, for those people you have brought to the Lord. So that you and they will walk in this narrow path that leads to heaven. That on that final day, when the time comes for you and for them, to present her in the presence of the Lord. That she will be there and they too will be there. Then will you have the reward of a great work well done. Prayer God will keep you awake as we learn the word together today. And pray for others. In all our Bible study locations tonight, that the same blessing God pours upon us today, as we learn together over here, that same blessing will come to them and enrich their lives, and make them to be the kind of Christian, the kind of believer, the kind of saint, sanctified people that they ought to be. Unite your heart with the word, the word of God. Love him and love his word. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. But that God will help you to keep on looking unto Jesus. Every time, every moment, every bend of the way, that you see him, and see him alone, looking forward to that time when God, according to his promise, will reward all those who stand faithfully, uncompromisingly, on the teaching of his word that he brings to us every time. Pray that the Lord will so help you that you'll be a very sincere, righteous, holy, sanctified believer. Not a superficial, hypocritical church member, but a sincere, committed, consecrated, devoted child of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the Bible study tonight. We thank you, Lord, because you've gathered us together so that your word will do something great, something wonderful, something purifying, sanctifying in every life tonight. Lord, we pray that tonight your will, your purpose, your goal, your dream, your desire for every one of us as you bring us to the study tonight will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that only your will, not the will of Satan, only your will, not the will of the society, only your will, not the will of self, only your will, the will of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be done in our lives in Jesus' name. 
that Lord, you are the living word. You've given us a reaching word. And as we come to study this reaching word today, we're praying that you, Lord, the living word, will make everything clear and plain open to everyone tonight. In Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to understand the interpretation of the word, the application of the word, so that, Lord, we live our lives day after day, moment after moment, according to the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, make us strong by this word, sanctified by this word, purified by this word, consistent by this word, that, Lord, we so commit and consecrate our lives unto you, and we follow what you're teaching us in your word, and your grace will see us and make us to be the kind of people you want us to be, in Jesus' name. And we pray that we don't only receive the word and hide the word in our hearts, we also reach out to all the people around us, so that, Lord, everything we've learned, everything we're living by, we'll be able to present to all the people, and that you will live by this word in Jesus' name. Open our eyes tonight. Make us to see and make us to know. Give us the grace for godliness that through this word we become more righteous, more sanctified, and more holy and more godly in your sight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 8 tonight. We've been studying Daniel for some months now. And the Lord has been revealing to us some rich, rich things in the Word of God. We'll study from chapter 1 through to chapter 6. That tells us the historical part of the book. And that actually reveals to us the principles of the godly life. Now, the Lord is bringing us to this second section, starting from chapter 7. And that talks about the prophecies that the Lord revealed unto Daniel. We've gone through chapter 7 already. Look at chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream, and he told the sum of the matters. We're told over here, in the first year of Belshazzar the king, was when he received the dream, the vision, the revelation, the prophecy that he got in chapter 7. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first time, at the first. Here we learn that two years after, the Lord revealed once again unto Daniel the revelation that he gave unto him. This actually is a follow-up on what he had learned and what he had seen in chapter 7. In chapter 7, he had seen four empires, four kingdoms. Number one, the Babylonian Empire. Number two, the Middle Persian Empire. Number three, the Grecian Empire. And number four, the Roman Empire. And when you saw everything that happened, or everything that will happen through all those four empires and kingdoms, it was so sad, it was so sorrowful. Because of the impact of that revelation, and because of what those kings and kingdoms will do against the children of Israel. Look at chapter 7, verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me the children of israel must have been wondering now that the 70 years of captivity of the children of israel in babylon those 70 years were to come to an end what will become of the children of israel they had thought obviously after those 70 years they'll be rest There'll be peace. There'll be tranquility for every one of them. Prosperity will come once again. Everyone will go back to their land. And then the Lord began to reveal to Daniel that the Babylonian captivity was not the end. That the Middle Persian Empire was still coming. And that will have a negative oppressing attitude or posture and pressure upon the children of Israel. And even after that time, the Grecian people too will come and it will bring some real pressure problem persecution upon the children of Israel. And then the last one, the Roman government will come. And then the king of that Roman government will so oppress the children of Israel. And that's why uh, Daniel, who had thought, now after 70 years of captivity, everything will be over. Now he saw that 
greater problems were coming and greater challenges were coming. That's why I said, the visions of my head troubled me very much. Look at chapter 7, verse 28. It says in chapter 20, verse 28, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations, my thoughts, my meditations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. It did like real students of the Bible, scholars in the Bible, that ought to meditate on the Word of God. And what he meditated on actually brought some sorrow in his heart, and that made him to see that he had to prepare himself so that he will be able to serve the Lord whatever government was there, whatever empire was there, whatever kingdom was there, he must keep on serving the Lord. He knew that in this life, whether you honor the Babylonian government, you honor the Middle Persian kingdom, you honor the um, Grecian empire, or you might even be under the Roman domain, it doesn't matter. The problems are there in the world. All you need to do is keep on looking unto the Lord, and then as you look up to the Lord, the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. And so he comes to chapter 8 now. And he, as he comes to chapter 8, he said, this one came in the, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. He said, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the falls. He said, I thought I'd seen it all. I thought I'd known it all. But this other vision came again. And it was two years after the third year of the reign of Belshazzar the king. And then, uh, what impact did this have upon him? Look at verse 27. Chapter 8, verse 27. I, Daniel, fainted. I was six certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. You see, Daniel had that attitude because he understood the vision. He knew what was coming upon his people, upon the children of Israel. But the people that didn't understand, they just went their way and they did everything they always did. They acted the way they always acted and they thought the way they always thought and they just went about doing whatever they always did because they didn't understand. Isn't that the pity in our lives today that those who do not understand the word of God, maybe they even come to the Bible study, but they are not like Daniel that will meditate upon the word and think about the word and apply the word to their hearts and see what is coming ahead. And because they just come to the Bible study and then they go back without any understanding, they always do what they did before, act the way they acted before, think the way they thought before. And they went the same way they, 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 they have gone before. But in the case of Daniel and people like Daniel, you study the word, you meditate upon the word, you think about the word and you apply the word to your heart is going to make you different and the evidence of studying that word, the evidence of meditating on that word and the evidence of applying that word with understanding in your heart is going to show at the times the word of God will make you glad, make you happy other times it will make you sad and sorrowful as you see what is coming upon the world in which we live. In the case of Daniel, God gave him the vision he gave him instruction and encouragement so that not only himself but the Jews also will have instruction, admonition and they will learn from everything they were hearing and they will be wondering will the Jews now have universal peace and prosperity? Would they now be free from dominion or domination of any world power? This vision is revealed that they might know what trials and tribulations still were before them, knowing the facts of the events which were still ahead of them will make them to prepare so that they will seek the Lord and they will draw close near unto the Lord. It should have that same impact and that same challenge and that same implication upon every one of us. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Why is Paul talking like that? Why is he saying, hey, you don't need for me to write to you again. He's saying, have you read Daniel? Then you understand the times and the seasons. Have you listened to the Lord Jesus Christ when he prophesied about the future? And then he tells us when the desolation of abomination will come, spoken about by Daniel. If you have read that, then you don't need for me to tell 
tell you once again about the times and the seasons. If you have not listened to Daniel, if you have not listened to the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle told them, you listen to me. I've told you, Thessalonians, how things are going to come. And therefore, you do not need to say, you do not know, in verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. He's uh, referring us back to Daniel now, when the children of Israel would have said, Now praise the Lord, the Babylonian captivity is not over. What are we going to have now? Peace and safety. Because Belshazzar is dead. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. And the Babylonian captivity is over. Then Daniel said at that time they will say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction shall come upon them. Because the Middle Persian Empire will be a very serious and cruel, wicked empire. Do you know it was the, during the Middle Persian Empire that Daniel was cast in Lion's den? And so it means just because Nebuchadnezzar is gone. Just because Belshazzar is gone. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy. That's why Paul the Apostle was telling the people, one era is gone, one domination is gone, one kingdom is gone, one empire is gone. But it doesn't mean that everything is over. In fact, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman or child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren, and not in darkness, that that day should over take you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, therefore, it is the reason why we're studying. This is why we know about those prophecies. This is the reason why we're looking at it over and over. The prophecies and the dreams and the visions that God showed unto Daniel. Therefore, because you know, and you're no more in the dark, because you know, and you're no more in confusion. Because you know, and the revelation of the Lord is not covered or hidden from you. Because you know, therefore, it says, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And that's what the study of prophecy should do for us. That's what the study of Daniel, the prophetic part of the study, that's what it should do for us, that you become sober, you become watchful because you know the things that you know. Knowing this fact should draw us nearer to God and should make us to have God as our hope. The message of divinely inspired prophets in the scripture is to strengthen us, is to prepare us for the coming world event so that that day does not come upon any of us on our ways. But you know, Daniel did something. Let's come back to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel didn't understand everything at the time the Lord revealed unto him, but he was searching. He was seeking. He wanted to know. He wanted to have a proper understanding of what he heard. Of what was revealed unto him. How many people read the Bible? They don't understand. They don't bother. They don't say, Lord, give me understanding. They don't say, Lord, I need to understand this. But in the case of Daniel, when these revelations came to him, he sought for the meaning. He sought for the interpretation. He sought for the understanding. And God always gave him understanding because that's what he sought. Ask, it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Because Daniel wanted to know. That's why God revealed to him. Because he sought for the meaning. Look at chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. Daniel chapter 8 verse 15. And it came to pass. When I, even I Daniel, had seen the vision. And sought for the meaning. And sought for the meaning. Do you do that? When you have the outline in your hand. Do you see stick for the meaning? For the meaning? When you open the Bible, you read, do you seek for the meaning? Or do you just read, I've read one chapter today in the Bible. I've read three chapters today in the Bible. Is that all? Do you understand? Do you seek to understand? Do you seek to find out what's the meaning of this? What's the impact and what's the uh, consequence of this that I've learned? He said, I sought for the meaning. 
Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision, because he sought for the meaning. That's the reason why the angel said to another angel, Gabriel, and said, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid, and I fell on, upon my face. And he said unto me, Understand, O, o son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end the thing shall be. Look at verse 19, and he said, Behold, I will make thee to know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. He sought for the meaning, that's why the Lord honored him and gave him the interpretation of the words of the vision of the dream he had had. And if you seek, you'll find in Jesus' name. Tonight, as we look at Daniel chapter 8, reading from verse 1 all through to verse 14, we're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, the, under, the underestimated power of a self-willed king. The underestimated power. Yes, the power. But the power that other people did not think about. They didn't think that you'll have such power. That uh, Middle Persian Empire. That they will have such great, oppressive, crushing power. The underestimated power of a self-willed king. Number two. The undisputable prowess of a savage, wicked king. The undisputable prowess. That means power. And strength of a savage, cruel, wicked king. Number three, the undisguised perversion of a sacrilegious, blasphemous king. The undisguised perversion of a sacrilegious, blasphemous, profane, wicked king. We come to number one, the underestimated power of a self-willed king. I'm reading from verse one again, Daniel chapter eight. We're looking at verse 1. In the third year of the, of the reign of, of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, at, unto me, Daniel. After that, which appeared to me at the force, I saw in a vision. And it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I saw by the river of Eli. And you need to understand what is being said here. Belshazzar was still alive. And the palace was still in Babylon. But the Lord said, Belshazzar will soon go. And he revealed that to Daniel. And the Lord took Belshazzar to the capital and the palace of the Middle Persian Empire that will eventually come up. That's why he said he was in Shushan, in the palace. And that wasn't the palace at the time of Belshazzar. But it, the Lord was revealing to him that Belshazzar will die. Belshazzar will go. And the new time will come when the Persian government will then have their center, their palace, and the seat of government in Shushan. Then he said in verse 3, Then I lifted up mine eyes, and I saw, and behold, they stood before the river, a ram which had two horns. Were there for a moment when you see a ram? There's not a lion, there's not a leopard, there's not a bear. And everybody would have thought, this one can do nothing. This is sheepish. This is dull. This will not amount to anything. This cannot oppress anybody. It's just a ram. But then what surprised Daniel is that even though it was a ram with two horns, he said, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And the higher came up last. He said, I saw the ram. And when I saw the ram, it had two horns, and one horn was higher than the other. And as you observe very closely, then you saw that it was the last horn that became higher. In verse 4, and I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no bees might stand before him. What surprised Daniel is that a ram, ordinary ram, pushing west and east, 
and north, pushing everybody and pushing all the other rams down. And nobody could stand before the ram. No, no bees could stand before the ram. Then it says, so that no bees might stand before him. Neither was there any that could, deli- that could be delivered out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. That's what Daniel saw. And what Daniel saw actually revealed the empire of the Medo Persians. Look at verse 15 now once again. Daniel chapter 8, verse 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. What could this mean? A ram or two horns? And one horn was higher than the other? And the higher horn came up last. What could this mean? Daniel be- began, became inquisitive. He wanted to know. And because he wanted to know, he said, I sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. In verse 16, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, that's an angel, angel Gabriel, make this man, Daniel, to understand the vision. And then, now the angel explained the vision. Look at verse 20. The ram which thou sawest have been two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Now he understood. The horn actually stands for strength. Stands for power. If you see two animals uh, waging war against one another before fighting one another in a battle before, you'll see they use their horn to fight one another. And it's the horn that is, that's their power, that's their strength. And the power of the kingdom is what was revealed by the two horns. On the one side, the Medians. On the other side, the Medes. On the other side, the Persians. And the Medes, they came first. But the portion that came later, they became stronger. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. Talking about this ram. And about the power. About the strength. About the two horns, the middle Persian empire. In Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the medis against them. They came, they came up first. And even though they came up first, they became weaker. And eventually the Persians had a dominion, a greater power, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows shall also shall dash the young men to pieces. And they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare the children. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, excellen- Chaldeans excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the prophecy that Babylon was going to be destroyed, was going to be overcome, was going to be devastated, and it will be done by the Medes to start with, and then after that, the Persians will join them. Uh, the vision appeared to Daniel. After that, which had appeared to him at the first, the first vision was recorded in chapter 7. In this vision, which he received before the reign of Cyrus, the Persian king, he saw himself at Shushan in the palace. Shushan later became the capital of Persia after the time of Cyrus, in which the kings of Persia had their principal residence, their palace. God gave Daniel a foresight of the destruction of Babylon and the establishment of the Middle Persian Empire. That's the compound word there, the Middle Persian Empire, the Medes on the one side and the Persians on the other side, and they join it together in a sort of united kingdom, knowing the changes that were to come. His heart could rest on the unchanging God because he knew changes are coming. That's why he didn't put his trust, his mind, his soul focus and hope upon any kingdom. You know that Daniel had opportunities and privileges in the Babylonian Empire. But he didn't put his heart on that because he knew everything will change. And if you're going to put your trust and your confidence and your hope on anyone, on anything, it should be on something, on someone that will not change. That's why he put his confidence and his trust, his hope in the unchanging God. There are many people today, they put their hope in man. Their confidence in man. 
not understanding that everything around you will decay and die and be destroyed. But it's only God that does not change. If you are as wise as Daniel, you'll put your trust and your hope and your comp- confidence on God that changes not. Because Daniel knew that everything will change. Because of that, he put his hope in God and he rested on the unchanging God. Could we foresee the changes that shall be hereafter? When we are gone, we should less admire the events of the present time and we shall be less affected by the events of the present time. As we have read, Daniel saw a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high. There can be no mistake in interpreting the picture or the imagery of the ram because in verse 20, the angel expressly revealed that it represents the two kings of Media and Persia. The united power of the Middle Persian kingdom was, do, was denoted, represented, symbolized by the ram itself. The two horns on the ram symbolize the fact that there were two powers or kingdoms combined in the empire. And it says, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. The higher horn springing up last denotes or represents, symbolizes the Persian government, which became the mightier power of the two. Now let's come back to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and look at verse 4. Something very significant of that realm, of that kingdom, of the personalities behind that empire. In Daniel chapter 8 verse 4, I saw the realm pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his son. Listen to this now. But he did. According to his will, and became great, we must not pass over that without some explanation. He did according to his will. That means he he didn't care about the will of God, about the mind of God, about the demand of God. All he wanted to do, all those empires, all they wanted to do was to do according to their will. And... How do you understand that? Doing according to one's will. Actually, that means that they were inspired by Satan. Because it is Satan that just does his own will without any reference to the Almighty God. He says, I don't care whether God is there or not. I just want to do my will. And those kings, when they did according to their will, they actually followed after the pattern and the principle and the practice of Satan. And let's come to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, you'll see that doing according to his own will is actually following after the devil, after Satan. It says in chapter 14 of Isaiah verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, son of the morning? How, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And this is Lucifer, the fallen angel. And it's when people are falling. And they have the fallen nature, the depraved nature, the sinful nature. It's when they have the nature of Satan within them that their will is the only thing that counts. Their own desires, that those are the only things that count. And what they want and what they will, that is the only thing that counts. They don't, want, they don't care about the will of God, about the word of God, about the wisdom of God, about the demand of God. All they want is their will. That is the falling nature. That's exactly what Satan said, what falling Lucifer said. I will, I will. And he said that I will so many times. Look at verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's it. In competition with the most high. Does the most high have his own commandments? Have my own commandments too. 
Does he have his own demand? I have my own demand, too. Does he have his pleasure? I have my pleasures, too. Does he say, I will? I also say, I will. Satan sets himself in competition against the Lord. And when this king represented by the arm, the kingdom, the Middle Persian kingdom, when they rose up, the only thing that mattered to them was their own will. And it says, they did according to their own will and became great. In verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Then in verse 16, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth tremble and that did shake the kingdoms? You see, when people do their own will, they become so powerful, so mighty. And then as they look at them, they shake almost everything and they congratulate themselves that they can turn everything around because they're not caring about the will of God. All they care about is their will. That's what you have read in Daniel chapter 8, verse 4. He did according to his own will and became great. That's what we're reading over here today. This is the man that did shake the whole earth and then he shook also the kingdoms because he said, my will is the only thing that matters. But look at the end in verse 17 that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. And yet the end will come. I pray we will not be like that in Jesus' name. But you know there are people that are also like that. They are also they're like Satan, like fallen Lucifer. There are people that like the uh, ram, like that Middle Persian Empire that just wanted to do only their will. That's the only thing they care about. Only their will. That's the only thing that they are concerned about. Only their will. That's the only thing they are ever interested in. Will of God? No, they don't have any interest. The will of Christ, our Lord and Savior? No, they don't have any interest. The only thing interesting to them is their will. Look at their language in Psalm 12. I'm reading from Psalm 12, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 12, verses 3 and 4. And as we read this, you are asking yourself, are you like this? Are you saved? Are you born again? Has your will been crushed, swallowed up in the will of God? Or are you a self willed man, a self willed woman, a self willed church goer? And that your will, your desires, your demand, whatever you want, the time you want it, the way you want it, must be. Isn't that the very root of sin? Actually, sin, S-I-N. You may want to write that down, sin, S-I-N. Actually, it's Satan's imparted nature. Satan's imparted nature. And the nature of Satan is the nature of self-will. I will. I will. I want to be in control, in charge of everything. I don't want God controlling me. That's the very center of sin. I don't want the word of God controlling me. That's the very root of sin. Satan's imparted nature. And the people that have the mind and the heart and the spirit of the Middle Persian Empire, they want to do according to their own will and brush God aside. That's what other people call it, ego, E-G-O, ego, E-G-O, that means just me, edging God otherwise, outside, edging God out, ego, God, don't get involved with my life, I want to rule my life, I want to go my own way, edging God out. In Psalm 12, I'm reading verses 3 and 4. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Sorry, that's chapter 13, chapter 12. Psalm 12, verse 3. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? That's it, edging God out, Satan's imparted nature. That's me. I just want to do what I want to do. 
the time I want to do it, the place I want to do it, and how I want to do it, and they don't care about what God desires. Jeremiah chapter 18. This nature of Satan that says, I will, doing according to his own will. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 12. And he said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. They say there's no hope of change, no hope of salvation, no hope of turning around, no hope of transformation. They said, we will walk at our own devices, and we will, everyone, do the imagination of his own heart, Satan's imparted nature. I will. I don't care about the will of God. I don't think about the will of God. I don't want to go the direction of God. That's Satan's imparted nature. And you want to come to the Lord, that Lord, I don't want this kind of life because it's going to end in judgment, in destruction, in death, doom, and damnation. In Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. I'm reading from verse 16. As for the watch that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That's the nature we're talking about. The people that read the word of God and study the word of God and hear the word of God. And they do not allow the word of God to have a transforming transformation, uh, transforming impact in their lives. And they just say, for the word you have spoken from the word of the Lord, we will not hack in unto thee, verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our own mouth. That the self will that that Middle Persian kingdom or king arch and then became great because of that and thought that was all. They didn't have to think about God or think about the word of God. They were only to think about themselves. What's the result of that? Not doing the will of God, doing only your own will. In Luke chapter 12, verse 47. Luke chapter 12, I'm reading there from verse 47. Those who are not committed to the will of God are only committed to their own self will. What they feel, what they think, what ideas come to them, what they want to do, and they are not influenced at all by the word of God. In Luke chapter 12 verse 47, and that servant which knew is Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That means judgment will come upon them. I pray we'll escape that judgment in Jesus' name. I said we'll escape the judgment in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. And you'll see how this is repeated over and over. It's such a great concern in the mind of God that people will follow after Satan and have that Satan's imparted nature and never shake it off, never repent, never turn, never have regeneration, transformation, change, never become a new creature. And they just go through life doing their own will. It's a sign of not being born again. It's a sign of no conversion. It's a sign of nominal religion. Still retaining Satan's imparted nature. In Daniel chapter 11, I'm reading there from verse 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. That's a characteristic of the beastly nature, of the sinful nature, of the Adamic nature, will do according to his own will. Verse 16 of that same chapter 11. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. He that cometh after the, made up after the Babylonian empire, he will do according to his own will. Look at verse 36. And a king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, 
and magnify himself above every God. You see that? He'll say, no, I don't care for the commandments of God. He'll say, I don't care about the will of God. He'll say, I don't care about the word of God. He'll say, I don't care about whatever it is the Lord demands. I just want to do my own will. That verse 36, the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. I pray that God will save us from that in Jesus' name. Because self-will always results in self-destruction, in damnation, in judgment. That's why you need to pray that God will break your will, will destroy that self-will, and will give you the very mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who made himself of no reputation. But he took on the form of a man, and being seen in the form of a servant, he humbled himself, even to the death, to the death of the cross. And he said, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. We'll come to point number two. Point number two, the undisputable prowess of a savage king. The undisputable prowess, strength, power, of a savage, wicked, cruel king. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8, verse 5. We've read about the ram with two horns, and one horn came up later, and the later one, the last one, was higher than the other. And we've learned that that ram with two horns actually represented the Middle Persian Empire. And that the Persian part of the empire actually became stronger than the Medes that came earlier. We now go to the second point, verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, and he God came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. That means it was almost like flying, very swift, very fast. And moving so rapidly as if he wasn't touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I have seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. The ram had been at the center stage. And the two horns had been devastating and destroying, pushing down westward and northward and southward. But now, when they say he goat came, he pushed at him with a great power. In verse 7, and I saw him come close unto the ram. And he was moved with color. That word color there means with anger, with fury against him. And smote the ram and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. What lesson do you learn there? Sometimes the people that are self-willed like the ram or two horns, they think I am and nobody else. I will do what I will do and nobody can touch me. And nobody can ever wage war against me, ever conquer me. But eventually, the he goat came and came against this ram that did that according to his own will and conquered him eventually. The end will soon come for those self-willed kingdoms, kings, princes, and people. He must say it, therefore, the he goat works very great now the ram is forgotten because the ram is destroyed. And it is now the he goat that is at the center stage. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Have you seen that no matter how strong they become, when they take over, eventually they are broken and destroyed. Eventually they come to their end. That tells us once again, change and the case, all I see. But Jesus Christ is the one that is same yesterday and today and forever. And it is the almighty God that is ever the same. He says, I am God. I change not. Everything on earth, every power on earth, every dominion on 
heaven and earth, every kingdom on earth, every king, everything will change. But it's the Almighty God alone that does not change. Therefore, the he goat was very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for each came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. This prophetic vision was still future for the Middle Persian Empire was not yet established at the time when Daniel saw this because it was here at the third year in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now it is all history because the vision has not been fulfilled in all its details. The ram that appeared unconquerable was eventually conquered. The Middle Persian Empire, represented by the two horned ram, continued through many years until they were conquered by Alexander the Great, that is the Grecian Empire. The Alexander the Great was, uh, was the son of Philip. The king of Macedonia, Alexander, was a great warrior and he was known for his sweetness, that is, his speed, how fast he was, represented by the he goat or the rough goat. Let's see the interpretation of the angel now in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, I'm going to read verse 20 again. We've read that before and then verse 21. Verse 20, the ram which thou sawest. I mean, two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. That's the ram. That now is gone, destroyed. Look at verse 21. And the he goat, the rough goat, is the king of Grisha. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the false kings. And we know from history that false king is the uh, is Alexander the Great, represented by the he goat. By the way, history has uh, told us that even though uh, that this man Alexander the Great did not know about this prophecy, do you know that he actually chose the he goat as the symbol of his kingdom? Think about that. That even though he had not read that. Daniel, even though he didn't study what he was studying tonight yet, when he became king, the emperor of the Grecian Empire, he actually chose the ego to be the symbol representation of his power, his might, his kingdom, his dominion. And we're told in Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 29, there be three things which go well, ye four a comely in going, a lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. And then in verse 31, and a great hand, and an he goat also, that he goat a king against whom there is no rising up. You see what uh, Proverbs says about the he goat, so mighty and so formidable, having such great power and strength and courage that there is no rising up against such an he goat. Though this prophecy of Daniel was unknown to Alexander the Great, the goat was actually used as an emblem of the Grecian Empire. This he goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Alexander the Great had a, a great notable strength. He pushed his conquest on, on so fast and with so much fury that no kingdom had the courage to resist him. And let's look at Daniel chapter 10 verse 20. Still talking about the Grecian Empire that was to follow the Middle Persian Empire. You'll see that the, the scripture makes it very very, very clear. There will be the Middle Persian Empire, and right after that will be the Grecian Empire. Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return for with the prince of Persia, or the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. You see Persia there, and after that Persia, the kingdom of Persia, then you have the Grecian Empire. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5, reading from verse 26. Isaiah 5, verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far. And will he son to them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with, with speed swiftly. It's talking about how fast, how fast the empire will move. 
to conquer everything aloud. None shall be weary, nor stumble among them, nor shall slumber, nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loose, nor the lashes of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp. And all their bows bench, their horses' oars, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their running shall be like a lion. They shall roar like, a, like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the running of the sea. And if one look upon unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow and light is darkened in the heavens thereof. It's just talking about the conquest that those the kings will have. And I pray that in the time of all this terror and all this evil that will come upon the world, you will not be here. I will not be here in Jesus' name. Because all this is still going to culminate in the time in the, of the coming of the Antichrist. And those who are in the world at that time, which I believe you will not be here at that time, those who will be here at that time, they will face terrible, terrible terror. And I pray that uh, God will deliver us in Jesus' name. Amos chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Amos chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. It tells us, therefore, the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall, be, shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Amos is now telling us, yes, Alexander the Great, he will be a great warrior. It will be a mighty king. And then it will be as if nothing can stand before him. But the flight shall perish. Are they fast? Do they move on speedily? Are they very swift in the way they conquer the world? But well, the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not, strong, shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handles the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is Courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in the day, says the Lord. That's talking about the defeat that will eventually come. And the defeat eventually came. Let's look at Daniel chapter 8. And I'm reading now from chapter 8 verse 8. Daniel chapter 8 verse 8. Therefore, the he got waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. When it was strong, it became strong. The great horn was broken. For it, and for it came up for notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. History has recorded that for us. That the prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled word for word. Eventually, actually, Alexander the Great began to reign at the age of 20. And by, in two years, he had conquered much of the world. In six years, he had conquered totally the Middle Persian Empire. And then he continued to conquer even more land beyond the Middle Persian Empire. By the age of 33, because of sensuality, because of living for the flesh, just drinking and feeding the flesh, eventually got sick and eventually died at the age of 33. That tells us the strong, the great horn was broken. And after he died, his kingdom was divided among four of his generals. Now, one of those uh, generals produced another king. That's what we're looking at now in chapter 8, reading from verse 9. Point number 3, the undisguised perversion of a sacrilegious king. The undisguised perversion of a sacrilegious, blasphemous, profane king. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. And out of one of them, that is one of those four kings or generals that came out of the kingdom of Alexander the Great after he was destroyed, out of, the, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. The pleasant land there that's referring to uh, the land of Israel. The pleasant land, the glorious land. This is the reason why Daniel was sorrowful. That after the Babylonian government, they will not be totally free. 
because they did totally turn to the Lord. The Lord removed their captivity, brought them back home. But they didn't repair the altar. They didn't worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And they didn't follow the word and the will and the way of the Lord. Because of that, their suffering continued. And it says over here, that little horn that will rise up out of one of those four kings coming out of Alexander the Great. It will push towards the pleasant land. In verse 10, and it works great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon it. Do you see what that uh, person will do when he came? Actually, this was fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes. And it says, this is what he will do. In verse 10, he will wax great even to the host of heaven. That's referring to the descendants of Abraham. Because God said, Abraham, look up and look at the stars of heaven. Your children, your descendants will be like the stars in heaven. And it cast down the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. That means he fought against the children of Israel and defeated them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Now this now going to the end of the world. That is at the time when the Antichrist will rise up. The power of the Antichrist will be the collective power of the Babylonian government, of the Grecian government, of the Middle Persian government, and also of the Roman government. And when you have the collective cruelty, the correct collective oppression, the collective power of all those mighty, wicked, cruel kingdoms or kings coming in the Antichrist, you know that terrible things will happen. And this now comes to that time of the end when even this antichrist symbolized now by this little horn going beyond antiochus epiphany and going to the antichrist he'll magnify himself to the prince of the host that is against the prince of princes the prince of peace against the lord jesus christ and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down that is antiochus he cast down down the sanctuary and the sacrifice and brought abomination and the dirty defiling uh, sacrifices upon the altar. And that's what the Antichrist will do when he comes. And they were told in verse 12, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. That is, the reason why Antiochus Epiphany had such great power is because the children of Israel themselves, they didn't repent. They didn't turn to the Lord. They still had transgression. Even though they came out of the Babylonian captivity, they remained in their sin because of the transgression. By reason of transgression, that reason he will cast them down and stamp upon them. And in that verse 12, and it cast down the truth to the ground. Think about that. That's the most serious. Defeating men and women, that's serious. And defeating uh, them in their altar in their sanctuary, that's serious. But now, casting the truth to the ground, that's the most serious of it all. And then it says, and it practiced and prospered. And uh, so we're learning then that this little horn will spring up out of one of the four notable ones. And from one of those four kingdoms into which the empire of uh, Alexander will be divided, there will spring up this ambitious, blasphemous king. All the circumstances of the prediction find their fulfillment in Antiochus Epiphany. This little horn became a great persecutor of the children of Israel, God's people. He set himself against the pleasant land, the land of Israel. It cast down some of the holes and the stars to the ground and stand upon them. Antiochus, in, in fulfilling of this, in the fulfillment of this, cast down and trampled on the people of God and the princes of the children of Israel with indignation and contempt. He persecuted the Jews. The Bible even says he magnified himself against the prince of the host, that is, against the ruler of the host of heaven. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. History has left, history has left it on record that Antiochus destroyed Jerusalem 
and killed much people in Israel and laid the sanctuary waste like a wilderness. He polluted and defiled the temple and sacrificed sin on clean animals like pigs on the altar of the Jewish uh, sanctuary. It, and it was, it cast down the truth to the ground. We read that already in verse 12. When it says it cast down the truth to the ground, what, what does that mean? Look at uh, Daniel chapter 10 verse 21. Daniel chapter 10, we're looking at verse 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. That's what he tried to cast to the ground. And when the Antichrist comes eventually, that's what he'll try to do. He'll cast the truth onto the ground. He'll say, what's the truth? What's the scripture? When the Antichrist comes, he will not worry about any truth, any doctrine, any doctrine of the scripture, any doctrine of righteousness. He'll cast it to the ground. And the people that do not love the truth, the people that hold the truth in unrighteousness, religious people, religious church goes. They will not have any alternative when the entry Christ comes and he casts the truth to the ground. They also will follow after the air of damnation and judgment, doom, devastation, judgment, destruction will come upon them. Let's look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 8. And you'll see that this, uh, this passage we are reading is talking about the Antichrist. And what we have read in Daniel, talking about Antiochus Epiphany, which is the first fulfillment of that prophecy, it will be leading eventually to the Antichrist, which will be the final fulfillment of what we have studied today. In Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. I pray you will not be deceived. I said you'll not be deceived. You know, sometimes there are people that uh, they leave the scriptures apart. And they say, well, they have, they conjure a kind of interpretation. But you know, the interpretation is very clear. Angel Gabriel told Daniel, I will tell you the interpretation of what you are reading. And it is from that interpretation we learn everything we're learning. Other people set all that aside. They, th they think they are wiser than Angel Gabriel. They are wiser than Daniel. They are wiser than the Almighty God. They are wiser than Jesus Christ, truth personified. And then they'll conjure up a kind of interpretation. I pray that those people will not deceive you. I said they will not deceive you. But you must keep your mind and keep your life and keep your ears away from what those deceivers, what they are trying to say. That's why it says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. That's talking about apostasy. A falling away from the truth. A falling away from the doctrines of the Bible. And when you look at religious people today, and you look at religious denominations and churches today, what is the truth again? There is a falling away. Which tells us the time of the end is right here. And then it says, And that man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. This is the fulfillment of what we're reading about in Daniel. The ultimate, the final fulfillment. When that man of sin, man of perdition will come. And he will exalt himself above all that is called God. And magnify himself above, beyond God. And then it says, so that is worship. So that he as God seated in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. It says, I will be equal with God. I'm also God. And he will exalt his throne. That's the I will, I will, I will. It says, God, keep your will to yourself. I have my own will to you. And the self-will will come to its climax in the Antichrist. And then it says in verse, in verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know. What with wholeness, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. At the time of Paul the Apostle, the mystery of iniquity was already working. 2,000 years ago, the spirit of the Antichrist was already operating. How much more now? As we look at society, as we look at people, as we look at their actions, as you look at the disobedience, 
I said, look at the sinful, self-willed manner in which people operate and live their lives. You can tell if the mystery of iniquity was at work 2,000 years ago, how much more today that disobedience and sin and rebellion is at the very center of the lives of people. The mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he will not let it were led until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him. He's talking about the Antichrist now. The Lord will fight against him and the Lord will conquer him. I said the Lord will conquer him. And all the people that have the spirit of the Antichrist, all the people that follow after the same pattern of life as the Antichrist, self-willed, doing according to their own will, not caring, not minding, not accepting the will of God. And living by the self-will of that Satan's imparted nature, the ego, etching God out. And they just say, I am and nobody else, I'll do whatever I want and nobody can challenge me. All those people will be defeated with the Antichrist. I pray you'll not be like that. But you know, it's repentance that is going to make you change. It's salvation that is going to make you a new creature. And it is submission to the will of God and submission to the Lord to sanctify you, uproot the Adamic nature, and take away that inbred sin. That is the thing that will totally make us totally submissive unto the Lord. And then that spirit of the Antichrist will not be upon us anymore. But for those who don't have any change, for those who don't have any turning around, any transformation, it says, even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that do what? Tell me out loud. That perish. That's where that self will, that's where it leads. That's where that Satan's imparted nature, that's where it leads. In them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. They cast the truth down to the ground, like the Antichrist, like Antiochus Epiphany. They cast it to the ground. They want the truth in their heart, in their mind, in their spirit, in their soul, in their lives, in their families. They don't want the truth to control them, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. I pray you'll not believe a lie. I pray the truth of the word of God will be at the center of your life, the center of your soul, and the center of your spirit in Jesus' name. There'll be a love for the truth, a passion for the truth, a desire for the truth. You're running after the truth. Just give me the truth. It may, it may be tough and difficult. Give it to me. It may make me to go the way of the cross. Give it to me. It may bring persecution. That's all I want because that's, I know that's what will lead me to glory land. Give it to me. You don't want anything that is uh, erroneous. You don't want anything that is false. All you want is the truth of the word of God. And I pray that this whole church will be a congregation of people desiring the truth of God in Jesus name and this truth we have got nothing will cast it to the ground we'll keep it in our heart, we'll keep it in our soul, we'll keep it in our mind, we'll keep it in our families, we'll keep it in, our, in the whole church, every house fellowship every district, every zone and every local church, every region every state and every nation where deep life is represented we're going to keep this truth we're not going to allow any spirit of antichrist or false prophet to come in the name of a united church or whatever, in the name of ecumenism, in the name of fellowship unity among churches and then take the truth away from us and just leave us with something shallow, we're not going to do that. I said we're not going to do that. We're going to preserve and keep the truth of the word of God and we're going to be an encouragement to other people that this truth will keep it to the very end in Jesus' name. Because if we don't, damnation and judgment will be the end. It says in verse, in verse 12 that they all might be damned. Who believe not the truth, 
but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And you know, I told you already from the scriptures that that spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. And people don't want the truth. They don't love the truth today. It's only very few people like um, you, you and I that love the truth of the word of God will be among the few in Jesus' name. In Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 4. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. The time will come, and the time has come already, when they shall turn their ears away from the truth. The spirit of the Antichrist has influenced them. And they have cast the truth to the ground. And because of that, the truth is not essential, not important to them anymore. They turn their ears away from the truth. And then they shall be turned unto fables. All they tell now in many of those pulpits, they just tell stories, stories, stories. Stories that do not have any relationship to deal with the truth of the word of God in the Bible. That's the mystery of iniquity already walking in many of those places. But here, by the grace of God, you and I, we are going to keep the truth of the word of God. But we need to avoid something now. We need to avoid something. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth that saves. The truth that sanctifies. The truth that makes us to walk in the path of righteousness. There are some people that are ever learning, ever learning, ever learning. And yet they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are superficial, they are shallow. They don't have any understanding of the truth. There is no repentance, there is no righteousness. There is no restitution. And there is no revival in their lives. They just learn and learn and learn. And the way they are today is the way they were last year. The way they are this year is the way they were five years ago. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And every time they hear the truth of the word of God, the spirit of the Antichrist will come and take away that truth from their heart. I pray that will not happen to you. And if you have been that person, you are ever learning, ever coming here Monday after Monday, week after week, and yet there is no change in your life, I pray that today will be your day of repentance. That the hand of the Lord himself will touch you and then the truth will not be cast to the ground anymore in your life in Jesus' name. And as you have the truth, the Lord is telling us something, I want to do with the truth. That you, you have to guard it, you have to preserve it, you have to keep it. And you do not allow anything or anyone to take away this truth from you. Not a friend, not a foe, not a relation and not a stranger, none, whatever, will you allow to take this word away from you. In Proverbs chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 23, we're looking at verse 23. I'm waiting for you to open the Bible, very important, very essential. Proverbs 23, verse 23. We're going to read it together. Are you there already? Have you opened it? One, two, go, everybody. God bless every one of you. Amen. Buy the truth and sell it not. Don't trade for this. Don't give it up for any reason. Don't exchange it for any reason. Somebody says, I'll be your friend. If you drop that truth, I'm sorry, you can go your way. I'll give you this, a great gift. I'll Let's exchange. Give me the truth. Forsake the truth. Abandon the truth. That's the spirit of the Antichrist coming. And he's saying, cast it to the ground. Don't worry about it anymore. You say, no. It says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. By the grace of God, this truth that we have got, nothing will take it away from us. Will not change it, will not dilute it, will not pollute it, will not uh, water it down. The truth, as we have got it, we are going to keep it in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in Jesus' name. But you are going to make a commitment, a decision, and you are going to make a consecration. Because already we have read from the word of God, the spirit of the Antichrist is here in the world. 
the mystery of iniquity is working already. And we find many, many people that Antichrist has visited. And they are given to change. They have changed everything they believed before. Everything they stood on before, they have changed. And they are not the way they used to be. But the Lord is saying, make a commitment that the truth you have got, you will not sell it. You will not give it up. And you'll not exchange it for anything, whatever, in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not of them that are given to change. Don't befriend them. The people that are given to change. Meddle not of them that are given to change. The people that exchange the truth they have for the falsehood that is going on in the world. Meddle not of them that are given to change. Why? Verse 22. For their calamity shall rise suddenly. Those people that change the truth. That cast the truth to the ground. That forsake the truth. That do not have the heart to receive and to retain the truth. Their calamity shall come, shall rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin of them both. That's why we're making a commitment to the Lord today. That we have chosen this way of truth. And we're never going to depart from it in Jesus name. I need a good, good amen there. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 30. Psalm 119, verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments have I laid before me. That's the commitment we are going to take to the Lord now, that we're not going to allow the spirit of the Antichrist that is walking about in the land, walking about in denominations and churches, walking about in religious circles to take the truth away from us. We have chosen the way of truth. We'll never depart away from it in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up now? We're going to pray. You'll tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'm here today. I've heard your word and I've seen the kingdoms will come and, cha- and, and, and go. And I know that powers will arise and powers will fall. I know that, uh, you know, the Babylonian government came and is gone. Middle Persian government came and is gone. And the Christian kingdom came and is gone. And the Roman dominion came and is gone. They're changing and changing and changing. Eventually, the spirit of the Antichrist is going to come and is going to try to take the truth away from the hearts of people. But Lord, here I am. I lay myself, stretch myself upon your altar. And I say, come what may. Whatever they say, whatever they do. Whatever persecution, pressure, problem, pain may come. I will never joke with this truth. I'll never give up this truth. I will never never, never rebel against your truth. I'm going to stand by your word, by the truth all the days of my life. Today I have the truth. I buy the truth. I get the truth. I receive the truth. I retain the truth. I'm not going to sell it for anything. I'm going to, I'm not going to give it up for anything. I give myself, my heart, my life unto you completely today. Consecrate yourself unto the Lord today day that you are not going to allow the spirit of the antichrist to take hold of you you are going to serve the lord in the truth for the rest of your life keep give yourself to the lord give yourself to the lord give yourself to the lord you remember the the real thing that actually started the ruin of those people the destruction of those people is that they wanted to do after their own will after their own will, tell the Lord, crush my will, destroy my will, swallow up my will, take self will away from me, turn away from all that and repent of your sin. It is repentance that will bring righteousness. And where you need to make restitution to your husband, to your wife, to your neighbor, to your friend, to your children, to your parents. You need to make restitution to your, to your employers, to your employees, or to your, co- at your neighbors, to your co-tenants, to your co-workers. Go ahead and do it. Don't allow the truth of righteousness to be taken away from you. The truth of restitution to be taken away from you. And not have that personal, strong self-will that will say, Yes, I know that's the word, but I will not obey. Obey the word of God. And you give yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, crush this self-will. Destroy this self-will. I don't want to be like that ram that did according to his own will. Like Antiochus, the Epiphanes that did his own will. Like the Antichrist doing his own will. Swallow up my will. I want to be like Jesus Christ who said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. 
that this might be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. That he wanted the will of God. Only the will of God. When it was difficult, when it was painful, Father, if this cup will not pass by me except I drink, Lord, Father, not my will, but thine be done. That's the will of Christ. That's the mind of Christ. Yield yourself completely to Christ. And say, Lord, I know my problem is this self-will. I know my problem is doing things according to my own will. I know the problem is this Satan imparted nature. Crush it. Destroy it. Take it away. I surrender. I yield it up. Tell the Lord. Let the word of God produce a change in your life. A transformation in your life. Where there's rebellion, there be, let there be repentance now. Where there's disobedience, let there be submission now. And say, no, Lord, I come. Get saved. Get born again. Be a real child of God. Not having your will. But the will of him that sent you here into the world. That's the way to glory land. That's the way to heaven. The way of the cross. Let the cross cross out and cancel that self-will in your heart. Don't be like that beast, like that ram doing according to his own will. Don't be like that he goat. Don't be a goat. Don't be a stubborn goat. A rebellious goat. A disobedient goat. Yield yourself to the Lord. On the final day, the sheep will be on one side and the goats will be on the other side. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and then he loses his own soul? What if you do your own will and you get money, you get power, you get position? Your popularity? What if you do your own will? And then you have independence? You have liberty? You have whatever it is you want? And then you lose your soul? What shall it profit you? If through self-will, you gain everything, and then you lose your soul, what will you give in exchange for your soul. Alexander the Great, represented by that he goat, became mighty and powerful. But it was a sin of the flesh that eventually destroyed him, drinking. Sensuality. The works of the flesh. Are you allowing the sins of the flesh in your life? Smoking? Drinking? Adultery? Fornication? Fleshly pleasure? The loss of the flesh. The loss of life. The loss of the eyes. The things that please the flesh. You want to allow your body to drag your soul to hell? That's what happened to Alexander the Great. He had great power. To conquer the Middle Persian kingdom. But he had no power, no control over his own spirit. No control, no power over his appetite. No power, no control over his tongue, over his taste. No control over his flesh. And that mighty, powerful king, emperor died such a shameful death. 
You don't want to be like that. You have more knowledge. The word of truth has been revealed to you. You can repent. You can be born again. You can get saved. You cannot be turning around. It change your life. You're not allow your flesh to drag you to eternal place of abode of falling Lucifer. Or Satan. Or the demons. Prepare to meet the Lord your God. Antiochus Epiphany, represented by that horn that rose from one of the kingdoms of Alexander the Great. When he rose up, he cast the truth to the ground. He cast the stars to the ground. He cast the sanctuary to the ground. He fought against the sanctuary, the place of worship. He fought against the stars. The people of God who are shining as stars in the firmament of heaven. And he cast the scripture, the scripture of truth, to the ground. Think about your life. Do you have any respect for the sanctuary? Any respect for the house of God? Or do you have the spirit of the Antichrist casting the sanctuary to the ground. Do you have any respect for the people of God? Are you casting the stars to the ground? The believers. We are the people that will shine as stars in the firmament of heaven. Those who turn many to righteousness. Are you being influenced by the spirit of the Antichrist? Controlled by the spirit of the Antichrist? Defiling the sanctuary. Defiling the saints, the stars. And polluting the scripture. Casting the truth to the ground. Having no respect for the truth of the word of God. No honor for the truth of the word of God. No reverence for the truth of the word of God. Are you following after the Antichrist? Casting the truth to the ground. Why don't you repent today? Why don't you tell the Lord, I will honor the word. I'll believe the word. I'll receive the word. I'll retain the word. I'll respect the word. I'll lay by the word. I'll pattern my life according to the word. The truth. I'll not cast it to the ground. I'll keep it in my heart. I'll cherish it in my heart. I'll hold it in my heart. I'll retain it in my heart. And whatever it commands that I will do. Wherever it leads there I will go. The truth. By the truth. And sell it not. Don't be like the people that are ever learning, ever learning, ever learning. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't be like the people that turn their ears and their minds and their hearts. Their concentration away from the truth. And they are turned onto fables. Don't be like the people that hold the truth and unrighteousness. Don't be like the people that do not love the truth. They don't have the love of the truth. And therefore God abandons them to their falsehood and to error. Be like the